So, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Buddha Garden Hall. Uh, a warm welcome to all of those who have been here this evening and uh, to those people who are listening online. Uh, uh, Peter Mackay is uh, our speaker this evening. He's well, well known throughout the uh, Spain. He's a long standing supporter of these talks and indeed has delivered quite a, quite a number of talks. Um, when we asked Peter to, to speak, we didn't realize he was going to do this talk in two parts. <laughs> so, so this is part two, but for those that missed part one, he's going to include part one as well in, in this. But just to say, we really appreciate your support. All the money that is raised through these um, talks that goes, goes towards the upkeep of this amazing facility that we have here. So thank you so much, all of you, for, for coming and supporting us. And Peter, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Well, it's good to be back um, relatively hale and hearty. Um, first of all, a word about the, um, the, the title. Um, uh, I, I would like to have said Reith and Rothy Marcus, or even better, Reith and Rothy. But in fact, um, it, it's a relatively sad story, this. Um, and that's why I put in wreath and a Greek tragedy. And as we go on, I think you'll, I hope you'll realize why I'm, I'm saying this. Um, my story began about 10 years ago, the first time we went into Rothy Mercus old church. And we went round to the other, other side of the church and we found this graveyard here. And um, I was rather a nerdish child and uh, interested in... Uh, Scots on the make, and the name Walsham rang a bell, and I thought, that must, that, is that Reith? I couldn't believe that John Reith of the BBC was in fact buried in Rothy Mercus Church, or at least his ashes were in Rothy Mercus Church, but so it proved to be. And this is indeed Lord Reith of Stonehaven, Knight of the Thistle, um, a Knight of the Grand Cross of the Victorian Order, Grand Cross of the Order of the British Empire, Companion of the Bath Military, etc., etc. A man of considerable achievement, but nonetheless, um, there is a degree of tragedy about him. You can see, this isn't the tragedy, but on his left cheek there is a great scar, and we'll come back to that. Um, but first of all, what is a Greek tragedy? I'm assuming everyone can read that, so I won't, I won't read it out, but um, basically these are the criteria. If you want to tick, if you tick all these boxes, you're a tragic Greek. Okay. Um, the story really, as far as Bednoch and Straspe are concerned, for Reith, it begins here at the Martineau Monument, which is at the junction, the Loch Ailen Junction. And this is a monument to uh, James Martineau, who was uh, a great religious um, uh, thinker in the 19th century, a Unitarian. And the reason that Reith came here was because Reith's father was um, a very distinguished free church, uh, Scottish free church minister. And they, their idea of a great summer holiday was to come up and discuss theology all summer. And they brought their children with them. And this is the monument to James Martineau and indeed to the Martineau sisters, who also did great work in, in Rothy Marcus at the end of the 19th century and ran art classes, uh, carving classes, and all sorts of things. So in 1897, um, Reith, for the first time as a, a, a boy of eight, came here. And this is the, the Rothy Marcus um, manse, the old manse, a Telford manse, the manse of the church we've just seen. And they used to come here often. And Reith developed a love for Badenoch um, which, and Straspe, which ran right through his life, as we'll see later. But this story is not really about uh, so much about Rothy Marcus, it's much more about Rees. His early years, um, pretty straightforward. He was born, I, I don't say by accident, but uh, <laughs> the family happened to be, I think, doing a locum in, in Stonehaven when Rees was, Rees was born. Um, son of George Reith, a very distinguished um, uh, free church minister, been minister of the, Trin the, the college church in Glasgow since the age of 23, um, later became moderator of the free church. 
And Reith was the youngest by 10 years. Of, he had six siblings, um, four brothers and two sisters, united really by a common hatred of each other. It was a remarkably dysfunctional family. Um, and this is one of the sadnesses that runs through Reith's story, is how nobody loved him, although he loved his mum and dad. Um, Reith went to the next door to Park School till the age of seven or eight, and then he went to Glasgow Academy, which in due course, when he'd achieved great things, brought him back for a prize giving and a speech, glossing over the fact that in, practice, in fact, he had been expelled, or if not expelled, asked to leave at the age of 16 from Glasgow Academy. And he then disappeared south uh, to Gresham's uh, school in Norfolk because one of his brothers, being the son of a free church minister and re rebelling, became an Anglican priest in, in Norfolk. So Reith went down to Norfolk. And in fact, having done not done very well at school, he had put in a strong finish um, at, at Gresham's. And all this time of his youth, he was coming here for holidays to Rothimerkus. Um, and indeed, in Kincraig, his father would take the manse at Kincraig. And uh, on one occasion, he was actually very nearly drowned in Loch Inch. So we nearly didn't have a BBC, or at least not a, a Rethian BBC. But they kept coming back, as, as we'll hear later. Um, uh, Reith um, was a man of ambition. This is Into the Wind, was his biography, autobiography, published in 1949. And of course, being um, ambitious, you need to have a, have a good conceit of yourself. And that was one thing that Reith certainly had. Um, and then the, the last one I'm just coming about is particularly sad in a way, because this was written at the age of 80. Looking back, he'd been nursing his wrath to keep it warm for 70 odd, 60 odd years that his father hadn't really appreciated what a great man Reese was destined to be. Um, so anyway, after um, uh, much debate in the family is what were they going to do with this boy who'd been expelled from the academy, disappeared to Gresham's Holt in Norfolk. Um, what, what was his future? And there was much debate. One, one brother who'd gone into engineering thought he ought to go into engineering. Another brother thought he should uh, be sent to a, uh, a, a nautical school. But they settled in the end. Um, his father thought engineering would be the thing for Reith. And Reith didn't want to be an engineer. I hope there are none in the audience tonight. But um, this, is, uh, this was Reith's view of engineering. Admittedly, he's talking about mechanical engineering rather than um, uh, the, the diggers and the shovelers. But anyway, um, so he, he really, you can guess it, he really didn't want to be an engineer. Um, so what do you think happened? He became an engineer. Uh, and he spent a couple of years, first couple of years, um, doing classes at what became um, the tech, the Royal College of Science and Technology, which is now Strathclyde. Uh, and he then became, uh, for the next five years, he was apprenticed at the North, North British Locomotive Works. Uh, and he qualified as a journeyman railway fitter. For those of you who thought that the BB, BBC was run by people who got PPEs from Oxford or Cambridge, uh, it's quite a thought that in fact it was BBC was created by a qualified journeyman railway fitter. Um, but despite that, he was able to join the Glasgow University OTC, which he loved. He was of a military disposition. He loved the OTC. And after a brief spell in London, when war broke out, um, he went to the front with a transport officer with the Scottish Rifles and the Cameronians. And later on, he uh, actually moved from the Cameroonians to become an, an engineer. But that all ended, um, the military service ended when he was uh, badly wounded at the Battle of Luz in late 1915. He was shot and as you saw in that earlier photograph, he got sustained a 
pretty serious um, wound in his in his cheek, but he survived. And um, the next thing we hear was that he he went to America. He got signed up with an engineering firm and did well in London. And they said, "You're just the kind of chap we need to go out to America and work for the British government and supervise the Remington um, munitions work." Where it, who were contracted to provide millions of, of rifles for the, the British Army. So Reith went out really representing the British government as a captain um, in, at the Remington Works on the, uh, the east side of America, um, a firm employing something like 13,000 workers. And Ruth was, Reith was there as the, the quality, quality controller, really, acting for the British government. And he was a tremendous success in in the States. He rolled his R's with great emphasis. He was six foot six. He was everybody's idea of a commanding Scotsman. And he, he went round America addressing, as well as his work at the, in the factory, he would be addressing local meetings, encouraging Uncle Sam to come and join the war in, in 1917, to such an extent that the British ambassador sent a letter back to Britain saying, what a great guy this Captain Reith is. He's doing far more for uh, encouraging the Americans to come and join us than almost anybody else. And Reith just loved America. Um, then for a short time, he, he came back um, and was a major in the Royal Engineers in charge of nearly 2,000 people building this amazing plan they had for an anti-submarine barrage across the channel. Uh, they were building massive great towers, uh, 100 feet high, uh, which they floated. The idea was to float them out, sink them, and then build another one up half a mile away and build another one. And Reith was in charge of that. So um, then having done that, or um, peace broke out, uh, to an extent to Reith's disappointment, because he, he, he enjoyed being in the army. He then became a civil servant and doing great work in the Ministry of Munitions, running down wartime contracts. Um, and then uh, he got a job um, with Beard, one of the Beardmore factories in Coat Bridge. And here again, he did great stuff here. It was a engineering business and he rationalized it, which wasn't a euphemism for sacking people. He just made it more efficient. He got on very well with the trade unions. He got on very well with the Coat Bridge Council. He persuaded them to build more um, uh, council houses for the workers, and indeed it was very successful. So it was all a bit of a surprise, really, when um, uh, not well, partly when he married Muriel, but I'll come back to that later. But um, also in March, he decided to give up the Beardmore job and he headed south to London looking for a job. He worked for a short time, um, where uh, a short time thinking that he might be a politician. He was a bit naive. He wrote to the Labour Party and said, I've always, always supported the Labour Party. He wrote to the Conservative Party saying more or less the same thing, except I've always supported the Conservative Party. And for a short time, he was um, he, he worked as secretary of, of a Tory group in, in London. And then, and then he saw an advert for the general manager of this new outfit, the British Broadcasting Company. And this is where we catch up to where I dropped out last time. Um, so he, in December of 1922, or nearly 100 years ago, uh, he turned up for his interview for general manager of the British Broadcasting Company. It's BBC, but not corporation, but company. Because in those days, the, um, the BBC was in fact owned by the half a dozen companies who actually manufactured radio sets. It was a commercial company operating under government licenses. So um, Reith uh, was in the line to uh, be the general manager of this, answerable to a commercial board of manufacturers of, of radios. Um, this is Reith from his, his diary. Uh, he was an inveterate diary writer, and we'll come back to this time and time again in this talk. Um, he, he reckoned it was four million words by the time he'd finished. Other people say two million, but it was an awful lot of words, and he poured his heart out into his diary. 
which was most um, uh, probably unwise as it turned out. But this is what he said about his interview with the broadcasting company. And that, in a sense, is, gives an idea of, of, of um, the, the state of broadcasting or the infancy of this, this great medium um, in, in 1922, that it was run really, the wirelesses themselves, radios themselves were technically in their infancy, and the idea of having a broadcasting company was, um, was a new one. And they were financed, of course, uh, from the early days under license from the post office, which laid down the conditions under which they should operate. And right from the beginning, Reith was hands-on. He literally personally interviewed all, all the new recruits for a long time. And the first six, seven years, he was interviewing them all. Quite disconcerting process. I mean, he, in the same interview, he would ask them, you know, do you love your mother? Uh, do you play rugby? Do you believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ? Uh, people wouldn't know where the questions were coming from, but he actually had the knack of choosing good people. Um, this next point, I think when most of us think of Rethian values, we think of this high moral tone, which we'll come back to later. Um, uh, he was hands-on when the Prime Minister uh, wanted to um, broadcast about the general strike. Reith introduced him, you know, this is the BBC and this is the Prime Minister and he is about to address us. When the general strike was over, Reith, off his own bat, put, um, played, um, uh, I think, uh, Jerusalem or some other uh, up uplifting um, tune on, on, on the radio just to cheer everybody up. Uh, hands on all the time. There was a complaint in the 1929 election that the people reading the results were reading a bit like football scores. They were saying things like, you know, race throwers two, Kirkcaldy one. And um, people didn't like the, um, the intonation. They wanted a more neutral. Uh, so that instead of saying Labour X, Tory that, they would be much more dispassionate. So Reith took it on. Uh, personally, sacked, sacked the announcer, who went off in a half, and told the press, and um, Reith collected a fair amount of criticism for the way he had not managed to um, enunciate the intricacies of the uh, home county's uh, constituencies. But that was typical of him. He would go take it on himself. Typical of him, too, was um, the way he developed relations with the palace, uh, he literally, um, he would uh, say, you know, this is um, a general manager of BBC speaking and I have pleasure in introducing His Royal Highness X or Y. Um, when uh, George V's life was moving peacefully to a close, it was Reith personally who announced the fact that closure had been reached. Um, when uh, Prince Edward, as he became um, the Duke of Windsor, uh, won his abdication broadcast, who should be there but helping him along was Reith. And for all that, in the end, he, um, he was very chuffed because at last he got an honour which he thought appropriate to him, a Grand Cross of the Royal Victorian Order. He'd been an assiduous scanner of the honours lists twice a, twice a year and the gloom fell on the Reith household when the honours list came out because they knew that Reith would be going through it line by line, saying, hmm, why has he got it? Why haven't I got it? But anyway, he was quite pleased. He thought the GCVO was appropriate to a man of his distinction. He had, by the time George VI died, he had actually also got a knight, picked up a knighthood on, on the way, but um, he made a bit of a fuss about that. He wasn't altogether sure that he should accept the knighthood. It wasn't really quite good enough for him. So he hummed and hawed for a couple of weeks and then finally rather grudgingly said, OK, if you must, uh, he got a knighthood. Um, so that was Reith and the Palace. I love this picture. This is uh, 1928. Uh, Reith is just knocking 40, and he is escorting our uh, revered and distinguished Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald. But it's, uh, <laughs> it's a nice juxtaposition of, of, of characters. You know, who's the arrogant one there? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and at the same time, he was seen really as a man who's dominating the BBC, domin uh, dominating the sort of cultural life of, 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 of Britain in many ways. And of course, he was developing a certain amount of hostile criticism. And because he was so powerful, so much of what he, he, his values were, were being imp imposed or presented or promulgated by the BBC. So Harold Lasky had a, a rather a perceptive um, account of it. The social, religious, ethical, political, um, absolutely that was Reith. And of course, the religion as well. He insisted right from the beginning that Sunday would be a day for quiet contemplation and um, the minimum of, of uh, secular secular pleasures. So Lasky's, I mean, it, I think in the benefit of hindsight, it seems to me a pretty fair summing up. But one has to accept that Reith's achievements really were remarkable. Um, he it was who, who promulgated this mantra, the duty of the BBC is to inform, to educate, and then to entertain. He in fact got that mantra from uh, an American writer, but nonetheless, um, it's very much that epitomizes Reithian values. Um, he it was Reith who really got them going on current affairs, um, news. Initially, they were very restricted on, on news because the newspaper owners, and I'll come back to this, were very uh, hostile to the BBC. The newspaper owners were saying it's not the BBC's job to promulgate news, that's what newspapers are for. So the initial license conditions more or less said you've only got, you can only issue news you know, once a day after six o'clock or something. But Reith fought that later. He, he was very much early on into the arts. He was into music uh, with Adrian Bolt and he set up the BBC um, orchestras. Religion we touched on, he got um, um, the leading relig religious figures in the land to come and advise on what to do. He pioneered outside broadcasts. He pioneered um, sport or broadcasting of sport. And latterly, one of his last acts was to set up the World Service. So he really did make the BBC as, as we think of it now. And part of the knack of that was despite his, his um, uh, idiosyncratic interviewing technique, he managed to get first class people. He was surrounded by very able people, all committed to pushing the Reithian virtues of um, values of informing, educating, and entertaining. Um, and he was a very good leader. We saw that a bit, at, um, we saw it in his army career. We saw it in, in, in the States. Uh, we, we saw it um, at Beardmore's in, in Coat Bridge. The one thing he was really good at was leadership. And when the BBC were, was got under hostile criticism um, for being too powerful, um, the staff rallied around him. And they had um, produced, a, not a petition, um, a round robin really, signed by all the staff saying what a great man Reith is, etc, etc. He really could take people with him. But he was a good leader, but probably, and we'll come on to this later, not a team player, unless he was a leader. And perhaps his greatest achievement was in underpinning the independence of the BBC right from the beginning, even when it was owned by the broadcasting, by the radio manufacturers. He, it was Reith who took on the newspaper owners who objected to his having news. Um, they and Initially, they wouldn't publicize his, the programs. Reith took them on. He fought them off. Um, and also, he, he had this vision that B, the BBC should not be a, a commercially run organization. It should be a public organization that dedicated to the public good, not for profit, um, pursuing the Reithian values. And eventually, he persuaded the government to set it up as a public uh, corporation, which um, it did become from 1927. Ironically, in fact, that brought trouble because once it became a public corporation, the government then appointed the governors, and uh, Reith did not get on very well with the early governors. But anyway, um, and he also, and this was pretty crucial too in the early days, um, the government were, saw the BBC uh, when it was both 
BBC company and, and it became the corporation. The BBC is a natural mouthpiece for it to put across its, its news uh, its, uh, and its views and to be a, a platform in which government ministers will come and address the nation on whatever, whenever they wanted about anything. Um, so that resulted early on with major head-on battles uh, between Reith and government ministers, especially Churchill. And Churchill is a recurring theme in, in this talk. Um, and finally, the BBC became in many ways an exemplar, a worldwide exemplar of what uh, a broadcasting company ought to be, a non-commercial one. So why did he leave uh, at the age of 49? Um, what he, he regretted it ever after, but he'd only himself to blame because from about, he left in 1938, from about 1935 onwards, he was complaining he hadn't got enough to do. He wasn't fully stretched. A man like him with his obvious abilities ought to be doing something else, even running the country. So why did he leave? The, the evidence is mixed. Um, he certainly, as I say, brought it on himself. There is a school of thought which says that the um, Conservatives um, uh, thought that he was um, socialist and the socialists thought he was conservative and either way he ought to go. Uh, that it was, as it were, a political decision. He was too powerful by half. He was unelected and they ought to find another job for him, which they did. Uh, and his first job um, was Imperial Airways. He became chairman of that and he again knocked that into shape. He was very good at rationalizing and reorganizing and out of Imperial Airways emerged the British Overseas Airways Corporation, a government nationalized industry in effect. He created that. Um, then war came in uh, 1939 and he for a short time, he became Minister for Information under Chamberlain and became an MP for Southampton, uh, non-party. I mean, he, he, I think, was a cross-bench MP, but he was elected in, in Southampton. And he said at one time he quite liked being an MP, especially if he didn't have to bother about the constituents. And um, so February 1914, he joins the Chamberlain government, not in the cabinet, which was always a source of irritation to him. Um, and then Churchill came, of course, after the fall of Norway in April, I think it was actually May 1940. Churchill said, wouldn't you like to be Minister for Transport? And Reith got stuck into that straight away. He'd always believed that the railways needed reorganisation, probably to be integrated and nationalised. Um, and his main achievement there was he was the one who said, remove all the signposts so that the German paratroopers get lost when they land. And um, so he was uh, MP from February 1940. And then to Reese, continuing dismay, in October 1940, he was sacked by Churchill from being Minister for Transport. He'd only been in, uh, in the Commons, really, from February to October. And he was then kicked upstairs to be Minister of Works and Planning in the Lords. And here he took it upon himself to be in charge and of planning for the reconstruction of post-war post -war Britain. And um, he was also in charge of works of building and um, procurement, rebuilding, war damage, planning for the future, um, in early planning on producing the planning system which came in 1947 Planning Act. Um, early on, one of the things he did here was uh, when the House of Commons was, uh, sorry, Parliament was bombed, uh, Reith was responsible for finding an alternative building for them in Church House in, in Westminster. So he was very hands-on here and, and he loved it. So from October 1940 until he was sacked by Churchill in 1942. And there he was feeling he was doing a really useful job. Uh, and he was, I think, by all accounts, doing a good job. Churchill sacked him. Why did he sack him? Well, Reith um, remember, Churchill was uh, in charge of a coalition government at this time. It was Conservatives, Liberals and, and Labour. And Reith really had not gone out of his way to attract any support from any of the parties. So Churchill needed to find it was a coalition, 
needed to find jobs for one of the boys of the other parties. Uh, Reese didn't fit in, so Reese was sacked. And he was he was desolate. He went through a uh, miserable period, 1942-43. He wanted to join the army. He wanted to join the Navy. Eventually, he was persuaded to join the Navy as a lieutenant commander, RNVR. Uh, and some of that is really rather funny later on because at the Admiralty, they didn't quite know what to do with a lieutenant commander who was a lord and a privy councillor. And I mean, Reith has tales in his diaries of the first, first sea lord um, coming in and uh, saluting Reith and Reith standing up and saluting the first sea lord. Each not quite sure you know, who, who has got precedence in these sort of situations, but he, he coped with it. And he got down to it. He was asked to reorganize. First of all, he reorganized the coastal forces. Then he was asked to look at the combined ops. This is Mountbatten preparing for D-Day. And Reese became really the key player by now promoted to Captain RN, which is pretty senior. Um, uh, he recommended the creation of this new directorate to look after the su supply of ships and uh, hardware for D-Day mainly old ships really, and things like Pluto, the pipeline under the under the ocean, the various, the Mulberry docks. Reese was in charge of all of that. And um, it worked, it worked a treat. And come D-Day, he got more than 2,000 craft were there, 99% availability. I mean, it was a tremendous success. He'd worked 18 hours a day. Uh, he'd more or less abandoned his family. He lived in London all, 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 um, all the time and lived in his club, just labored on this and produced um, this very, very effective outcome. So he really proved himself that he could actually organize um, and get things done. And the, the award of which he was most proud latterly was um, the companion, um, companion of the Bath military, because he proudly said in his diary, no other minister of state, no other minister has ever got one of these, and I, I am unique, which, I mean, he knew anyway. But, um, but that was over, D-Day was over, he was going through a difficult personal time uh, at this time, and what was he going to do? And his diary, which um, I mentioned before, he was full of his thoughts poured out of it, both personal and his relations with his family, his attitude to God, his attitude to his father, his mother, his wife, and his children was all in this diary. But he kept saying, what would I like to do next? Viceroy of India, he rather fancied, but and every time somebody else was appointed Viceroy of India, Reese would put in his diary, oh, blast, why is Wavell gone? Why is Mountbatten? I'm sure I could do a better job. And then um, the ambassador in Washington uh, died, and Reith said, that's my job, and he wrote to the Prime Minister and said, that's mine. The Prime Minister said, well, actually, I'm sending Lord Halifax, the Foreign Secretary, he'll do it better. Um, then the United Nations had, was beginning to be set up in 1945-46, and he thought that would be just right for me. In fact, it would have been a disaster because he wasn't very good at compromise and wheeling and dealing. Then he thought, how about being Secretary of State for War? And he didn't, he, these were not just thoughts in his diary. He actually got on to people and said, look, if you're looking for a Secretary of State for War, you know, I'm your man. Um, and he wanted uh, early, he always thought he knew about the railways. And um, later on, which is after the war now, when Dr. Beeching was appointed, Reith thought that was really the job for him, and he called Beeching in and told him how to do it. Um, quite fancied the coal board. And then he, he really thought, he, his son, he sent it, needless to say, sent his son to Eton, and he thought, well, actually, I'd quite fancy being the headmaster of Eton. And then someone said, well, actually, the top dog at Eton isn't the headmaster, it's a provost. So um, Reith backed off that one. And of course, all the time, right until he died, he was hoping to go get back to the BBC, keep all the time. Oh, why did I ever leave? You know, 15 years, I made a great job of it. I was a great man. And here I am looking for odd jobs. Um, he did get one job he really got stuck into. And he was put in charge of a committee to look at the case for new towns in, in Britain. 
and he produced a report in 1946 full of Rethian phrases. Um, this is his vision of the new towns. He was particularly worried about camouflage drinking. He was, for most of his life, he was a teetotaler. And what his objection to greyhound racing is God only know, knows, but anyway, this, this all appears in the Reese report. But in fact, there's a lot of good stuff in it as well. And of course, the government ran with that. And we had the whole series of 20 or 30 new towns were built after 19, after 1946. So that's thanks to Reese. So what else did he do? Um, this was the Colonial Development Corporation's job was to, to get business going in, in the colonies. He did that for 10 years very successfully. He chaired a new town very successfully. Uh, he had many private sector jobs, uh, particularly cable and wireless. Um, he also was deputy chairman of British Oxygen Company. The attraction there was that in those days, the deputy chairman got a Rolls Royce to drive around in uh, and a chauffeur. Um, he was chairman of a building society. He did all sorts of private sector jobs. 1965, uh, Churchill, when he sacked him in 1942, um, no, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, he became rector of Glasgow University. That had problems there because the rector, as many of you will know, chairs the university court, but is not actually the boss of the university. The boss of the university is the principal. And Rees could never get it into his head that although he chaired the court, he, he did not actually run the university. So he was always looking for real or imagined slights um, from the principal who hadn't told him about this or that. And when Reese wanted to suggest people for honorary degrees, the, pr the principal had to say, well, actually, um, Rector, this is really a matter for the Senate, but no doubt they will take a great interest in look at your recommendations carefully. So that wasn't a very happy experience. But then things changed a little bit. When Churchill sacked him in 1942, he offered him the job of being Lord High Commissioner to the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, which of course is representing the Queen and um, at the General Assembly. And Reith actually rather loved that. And then in 1969, having been Lord High Commissioner, he um, was then made uh, a Knight of the Thistle. Um, and this lovely picture here, this is Reith as the Lord High Commissioner. Uh, you wouldn't guess that that was a, a time-served um, engineer, railway engineer fitter leading the troops there. But in fact it is. It's Lord, Reith, Lord Reith heavily disguised, all six foot six of them, wearing the uniform of the archers, um, the Royal Company of Archers. The rather hunted looking man behind him there, who is characteristically out of step with Reese, um, was his son-in-law, and we'll come on to that later. Behind, behind the son-in-law, the Reverend Leishman is the Lord Provost of Edinburgh then, and by, lurking behind the Lord Provost is uh, the Secretary of State for Scotland, Willie Ross, my erstwhile boss. And this was Reese in his element. He just loved it. Um, in his diary, he wrote, this amazing turn of phrase, he was adequately circumstanced as Lord High Commissioner. He naturally slipped into the role of acting for the Queen. Um, and there was a famous occasion once when, um, uh, which is widely reported, I don't know what the source was, but um, an aide-de-com or the purse bearer or someone opened the, um, uh, the door of the I think by this time it was a Rolls because the first time uh, he was a commissioner, he had to do with an Austin princess. And he didn't think that was actually good enough. But, so they laid on the Rolls next time. And the door was opened and um, Lady Reith got to step in and was hauled back by um, Lord Reith saying, don't you realize woman, I am the queen's representative. He pushed himself in front of her and sat down. But he loved being the Lord High Commissioner. Um, but finally, he died in 1971. Okay, now that is a very quick run through his career. I mean, he was a great man who did great things. 
But really, I think what's much more interesting is what his diary reve reveals about his personal life. So, I mean, that is a, a record of achievement which anybody would justifiably be proud of. But Reith was strange. I mean, despite aspiring to be um, everything from the Viceroy of India to the ambassador to Washington, um, he sometimes was surprisingly self-aware, and he wrote this in his diary. <laughs> and that that is wreath by wreath, uh, and it's I think a pretty a pretty fair summary. And the Churchill thing, this obsession with Churchill, um, Reith always believed that the time to uh, to kick someone was when they were down. Um, and um, in 1946, after Churchill had lost the election, Reith wrote to him, "You know, why have you been beastly to me?" And again, in 1955, when Churchill finally retired and couldn't do anything, Reith wrote, look, you broke and you ruined my life. What are you going to do about it? Poor old Churchill. So this is Reith um, living in the past, obsessed with the past, really. But he had tremendous strengths. And the loyal, though dominating friend is an interesting thing that runs right through his life. The people he, who worked for him, uh, his secretaries and the staff, thought he was wonderful. He was always, he was supportive, he helped them. He was, could never do too much for them. But uh, sometimes it was a bit OTT. Um, for 10 years of his life, he was obsessed with this chap, Charlie Bowser. At the age of 23, Reith met Charlie um, in, in Glasgow. And every, when Reith got various jobs, he'd, find, he'd managed to get something for Charlie as well. I mean, it was an amazingly relation, amazing relationship. And his, his parents, I mean, his church, his free church minister, father and mother, all seemed to accept it, but he was obsessed by Charlie. They would come up to, to Avimor or Rothimurkus uh, on holidays. They'd carve the name on trees together, and Reith and Charlie, and um, he was obsessed by, by him. And Charlie even came to Coat Bridge as deputy manager there. And there's an amazing tale, really, of um, Charlie, Muriel, and John. Muriel was a wreath driver when he was a major in the Royal Engineers. And she'd drive him around. Charlie came and worked for him as in the Royal Engineers. And Charlie rather fancied Muriel. Um, but Reith didn't really think this was right. Um, it, would, it would spoil the relationship if Charlie went off with Muriel. Surely the best thing was if Reith took Muriel, and then they could be a main as well. Mm -hmm. It's all in the diary. Um, so after having been engaged to, well, when he was engaged to uh, Muriel, uh, he wrote a will leaving everything to Charlie. And he married, finally married Muriel in 1921, and they lived in Dunblane. Um, and then, um, Reith began to worry more about Charlie. Surely if John and Muriel were happy and they could Charlie find a wife for Charlie, they could all have a be a men as our cat and all live happily ever after. Not sure if you can read that at the back, I hope so. Um, anyway, they meet in Dunblane, they meet Maisie Henderson. 20,000 a year. Right. Charlie quite liked the girl, so Reith thought he'd do something about it. And Charlie, it works. Charlie marries Maisie in March 1922. But then Reith even wrote Charlie's speech. <laughs> <laughs> At the, Beard, the Beardmore works when they, they had a celebration for Charlie's wedding, Reith has written a speech. But then when after Charlie was married, 
Um, Charlie wrote to Reese and said, look, um, my loyalty now and my eye is, is to uh, is to Maisie and not to you. And uh, it's been great knowing you, but things are going to be different now. And it's at that point, 1922, that Reese gives up the Beardmore job and goes to London. Des not, I mean, he was bereft. He no longer had Charlie. He still had Muriel in, in uh, uh, Dunblane, but he hadn't got Charlie. What was he going to do? So he joined the BBC. Indeed, at one point, he even thought, maybe I could get Charlie into the BBC. But anyway, that was really the end of the relationship. But that, all that was really under the heading of his strength, the dominating, the loyal but dominating friend. So his weaknesses, I think you can see them here. I think what I've said speaks for itself. Um, the status conscious, uh, in very early days, he was invited to the Lord Mayor's banquet when he was just general manager of the, B the BBC. But he walked out because he thought the table he was in was not, was not good enough. Um, he very nearly boycotted one of the royal weddings because he hadn't got uh, a seat appropriate to a man of his position. Um, socially ambitious, yep. Um, tremendously socially ambitious for himself and for his family. Hopeless of money, when he finally died, he left £67 net. Uh, he'd lived uh, in a fine country house in Beaconsfield, in um, uh, Beaconsfield is Berkshire, I think, um, but rented house. He Latterly, he was, he'd lived um, in um, a rented accommodation in Lambeth Palace. He didn't own a house after about 1950. And by the time he died, he was living in a Grace and Faber house in, in Edinburgh. But he was hopeless with money. And I think the verging on insanity, he did actually. He was seen by psychiatrists from time to time. But the most searing bit of his life, really, is his relationship with his family. And this was a book published by his daughter, Marista, um, 10 years or so ago, published by the Church of Scotland. And it's an agonizing book to read. Um, you know, how a daughter could write this about her father is really always brings tears to one's eyes. And it was in some ways his, his great failure. He had a son, Christopher, whom he doted on initially. He sent to, sent to Eton. Well, before going to Eton, he made sure he was christened by the Archbishop of Canterbury with water flown in from the River Jordan. Um, despite Reese being a child of the, of the Free Church. Um, he sent his son to Eton. Um, he then sent his son to Oxford. He got into Worcester College, Oxford, because the master of Worcester um, felt he owed it to, to John Reese to help him his son, who wasn't really very academic. His son was quite a good rower, a oarsman, but um, Rees was disgusted when he didn't get selected for the Oxford boat and got onto the college and says, why haven't you, why haven't you chosen my boy for the boat? I mean, a source of extreme embarrassment, really, to his, to his son. Uh, he, he adored his daughter, Marista. Nothing was too good for her. Um, she was a good musician. Um, so he would get the uh, principal of the Royal Academy of Music to come and teach her. She showed interest in the organ. He, he got the organist from Westminster uh, Abbey to come and come and teach her. Um, she didn't want to go to Oxford, much to his disgust. She went to St Andrews, and he was appalled by her by going to St Andrews. Um, I went there myself, so <laughs> I think he was wrong. Uh, he wrote her forty letters uh, in her first ten-week term at St Andrews, just dominating all the time. And as a result, alienated really both of his children. It really was very sad. And as for his poor son-in-law, whom we saw in that picture of Reese disguised as an archer, the Reverend Murray Leishman could do no um, uh, could do, do no right. Reese famously boasted publicly, but this was from his diary, that he kept a hate list. <laughs> a 
mean, it, it, it is actually, it, beg, it beggars belief, and really it'd be much better to have burnt his diaries. But when, when Marista was finally, uh, after much parental opposition, uh, was going to marry the future son-in-law, the uh, Murray Lishman, um, uh, the Reverend George MacLeod, Lord MacLeod, uh, gave a speech in honour of the, um, uh, the groom, and Reith walked out in disgust, uh, caught the train to London, walked out of the reception. So poor old son-in-law. Um, but the saddest thing in some ways was his relationship with his wife. Um, as I said, he, he really proposed to her in the end to, to, to cut, cut Charlie Bowser out of it. And his many unkindnesses, this is self-awareness at last creeping in. His main unkindness, and we're coming to the end now, but we're also coming to the last bit of Bednach and Slaspe. Um, his main unkindness to her was his um, quite, I hesitate to say promiscuous, but he, um, his, he always liked to be accompanied by young women, usually his secretary, and he poured lavished gifts on them, spoilt them rotten, um, and one case even moved his secretary into a flat next door to his London flat. There's no suggestion of any sexual impropriety, but clearly um, he um, treated Muriel abominably. All the time Muriel would be sitting at home. And the many unkindness to her, in some ways the biggest unkindness to her was um, the way he behaved with this young woman, Dawn Mackay, uh, who's a remarkable woman. I gave this talk a few years ago um, and mentioned Dawn Mackay, and at the end of it, uh, an ISIL lady came up to me and said, you're quite right, Peter, I am Dawn Mackay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was Dawn Hargreaves, who many of you, are, I'm sure, will, will have come across her. I mean, a pillar of, of, uh, well, of Nettie Bridge at one stage, um, and then latterly in Granton, she ran the, um, uh, the finishing school, I think it was at Alt Moor in Nettie Bridge, latterly, and she was um, chairman of the children's panel up here. But Dawn Hargreaves um, was Dawn Mackay, and it was an amazing relationship. She was 19, Reith was 60, and... And for 12, Dawn was not um, an academic girl at all. I mean, she had, did secretarial training and then she taught dancing for um, Madame Vacani, who taught high society not just how to dance, but how to courtesy, how to curtsy and generally how to, um, how to behave. And she was there for 12 years. And in 1960, Reith uh, came across her again and was obsessed with her. And Muriel was, was sidelined. He poured, he lavished gifts on, on Dawn, um, uh, showered her with, with uh, jewellery um, on her birthdays, gave her ridiculous presents. Um, on, uh, famously on Reith's um, ruby wedding, um, his secretary had to remind her it was his, his ruby wedding. Um, he, they dined at home and he took her to see Ben-Hur um, the night before, uh, he had taken Dawn Mackay and Dawn Mackay's mother uh, to the opera, and they um, dined somewhere posh. I mean, it was just so insensitive in relation to, um, to Muriel. And Dawn, to be fair, or maybe unfair, I mean, Dawn lapped it up. Um, and in 1960, um, Reith famously, as I mentioned, was called back to Glasgow Academy as a great academical. Um, to tell the boys, you know, how, how to how to you live your life, and uh, he said, "Life, I have a young friend. She has told me, and great cheers from the boys when he said she has told me that life is for living. This is something I have just learned that life is for living. Make the most of it. It's so unlike the wreath we mentioned. And at that time, wreath went to Ascot, was seen drinking, um, drinking champagne, and living it up. Or pure." Poor Muriel, by this stage, spending most of her time with son Christopher on his farm in Perthshire. 
And the most amazing bit about the Dawn relationship was that um, um, she had gone, gone to Heathfield, which they tell me is a well-known girls' school uh, in, uh, in the South. And Reith was in the club sometime, and one of his chums in the club came up to awful trouble looking for a new headmistress for Heathfield. And uh, Reith said, I've got just a girl for you, just a girl. And um, as a result, he put Dawn in his Rolls Royce, and she was sent off to be interviewed by the governors of Heathfield, who promptly agreed that she would be a great headmistress and appointed her. And the press got onto this, and um, she was quite frank, and she said, well, I've got no academic experience, but I've been to the school. I think I'll make a good job of it. And by all accounts, she did make a good job of it, but um, she was rash enough to fall for the school bursar, uh, who was also rash enough to have been married before. So Dawn um, then had to, um, had to resign. But before she married the bus, there had been some ups and downs. And the last one of her last acts with Reith was to get on to Reith and say, um, Lord Reith, she always called him Lord Reith, um, there's an advert, something coming in out in the Times in a couple of days. It's my marriage, notice of my marriage. Could you get it withdrawn, please? <laughs> and Reith dutifully managed to get the Times to withdraw the notice of marriage for Dawn. Um, but she did subsequently marry, and she um, uh, then eventually came up to to Nettie Bridge and, and then to um, um, Granton. So this is Reese and Dawn living it up. And this, some of you from the Strathy, this is the obituary for Dawn or part of it. I mean, she's quite a character. I was very taken in my short meeting with her. And I can see why Rhys might have been captivated by her. But um, it was all at, at some cost. So what do we make of Rhys? Where does all this, all this take us now? We're, we're in the closing stages. Um, okay. The Dictionary of National Biography, and it's absolutely true according to his diary, just waiting for the phone calls, which never came. The Times obituary. So the final sort of summing up. I've often, uh, in my nerdish youth, used to think of Bach and John Bach and, and Reith in the same sort of breath. They were both ch children of the free, the free church manse and gone on to do great things. Uh, Buchan from a free church, Manson, near Kirkcaldy, then went on eventually to Oxford and um, finally died as, as Governor General of Canada. Reith, uh, very similar uh, honours, uh, a rather different route. The difference is that John Buchan died almost universally loved and, and, and loving, whereas poor old Reith um, did not. So come back to what is a Greek tragedy. And I think you'll agree that Reese ticks these boxes. Clearly, he was deeply flawed, to put it mildly. But he did great things at a tremendous cost to himself and his family. He, I think one has to say he would have been much better if he'd never married and never had children and probably never written a diary. And he himself at times more or less said that as well. But there's, he had one great redeeming feature for this audience at least. He loved Rothie, Rothie Mercus and Speyside and kept coming back to it. And the last page of his autobiography is this. I hope you can read it. I won't read it out. So underneath that rugged exterior, uh, there was a romantic. He just loved, he loved Rothie Marcus, and you, you can see why. Um, but he died unhappy despite that. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is it. Um, before I go, I'll just, sorry, I'll go back one. Um, I'll just leave you with that. And I can take any questions now, but um, 
that is a wonderful program which I came across quite by chance. Look it up on YouTube, not least because there are very frank interviews uh, between Greg Dyke and Marista, his daughter on the one hand, and Dawn Hargreaves on the other. And Dawn admits to some regret she had not appreciated as a, a flighty young thing, uh, 20, 28, 29, that how much hurt she was causing to Muriel and clearly, clearly regretted that. Okay, any questions? That, that was amazing. How many, how many of us knew that Lord Rees was buried in Rocky Murphys? I, I didn't. No, no. Yeah. Well, I didn't either until we started. Yeah. Remarkable. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, I wanted yeah. to ask where the BBC fits into the history of broadcasting altogether. What is the first... National as far as I know, it was. I mean, the, you, for that, you probably ought to read. I mean, Isa Briggs, I think, has produced about six volumes on the history of broadcasting. I think it really, really was um, a pioneer as a as a national corporation. I mean, there were private, a bit like you know Radio Luxembourg or um, uh, other sort of private sector broadcasters, and particularly in, in the states as well. And I think. The first public broadcasting service as such was somewhere in the States. Um, it was commercially owned, but it, it, it was um, broadcasting. But as far as I know, as I said, there, it was an exemplar, which many other countries followed in later life. And needless to say, um, Reith was deeply hostile to, com well, to television in the first instance and also to commercial broadcasting. And when the commercial channels came in, in 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 Britain in the late 50s, I think it would be. I mean, he he was doom and gloom from um, in the House of Lords. But I, I think he generally can claim to have been a pioneer. Okay. Um, Reith, they were named after him, more or less on the Silver Jubilee of the BBC in about 1947-48. And the governor, the chairman of the governors wrote to Reith, saying we propose to do this. And he more or less said, silly idea, uh, quite unnecessary. Um, and the first one was broadcast in 48 or 49. And um, Bertrand Russell gave the first Reith lecture. And Reef's diary is full of rub what, loads of rubbish, and he spoke spoke badly. I could have done better myself. So I mean, he he, he possibly secretly was rather chuffed, but he wouldn't admit it. Can you can you speak up? Okay. Just tell the master. Yeah. What happened to Muriel? Muriel um, died about five years later, and her ashes are are also scattered at um, um, in the Rothy Merkers Church. And also, I perhaps should add, um, some years about five or six years ago, a rather um, garish pink tombstone emerged, um, which is Christopher, son Christopher's tombstone. There, Christopher Reith is now. Uh, commemorated next to his, uh, I think his mother, he probably wouldn't want to necessarily be next to his father, but um, so Christopher is there. Uh, Marista is, is buried elsewhere. Marista died uh, a couple of years ago. I had a quick question earlier. You, you mentioned the, the old man's in Rothenburgus and they stayed there for some of their holidays. Yes. Were there other places in Speyside? That um, the only one I know definitely is the Free Church Mance in King Craig, um, mm -hmm. where, um, where where they stayed. I think uh, George Reith, the father, was um, doing a locum, as it were, for um, the local Free Church minister. I guess that was probably the pattern of, of, of the time for, um, for, for ministers that they would holiday in, in each other's parishes. Yes, yes. 
um, but um, when he came up with Charlie, I, I'm not quite sure where, where they where they probably in hotels. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. John. He was still living in Edinburgh when he died. Yes, he, 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 he was in what's called the Queen's House, yes, in, in Murray Place, which uh, was a grace and favour apartment bought for the Queen by the Lord Provost of the Cities, I think. And um, um, Reith, by that stage, we're talking 1970 now, he, he was still a tenant of the Archbishop of. Canterbury in, in, in London, but wanted to move north. And um, uh, as I say, a bit strapped for cash anyway. So this, this was great, but he only lived, lived there for a matter of months. Okay. Well, uh, so, yeah. I've just, in okay. case any of you are interested, I'll just put that down. <laughs> He became a real an establishment figure, and um, this is Charlie, right? <laughs> and and survived. I mean, having had this all, all enveloping relationship, dominating do relationship with Reese, he managed to to break out of it, and uh, he and Maisie lived happily ever after. I'm almost nervous to give you this in case you give me a wreath like response to say this isn't enough. Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll give you another response. I've already had one bottle for, for, for well, the no, first part. No, no, I deserve two. No, no, I insist. We can argue about that later. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, that was amazing. And, and uh, as a uh, as a masterpiece of advertising and production, to, to give it in two parts is great because you let, <laughs> let our appetites all those six weeks ago now. Yeah. And uh, certainly we've gone out to explore and find that graveyard in uh, in Rothenburgus, which is wonderfully, which is well hidden, yes. very well hidden, but well, well worth the, the visit if you can find it. Wonderful. I, uh, one of these things was, uh, he who prides himself on giving what he thinks the public wants is often creating a fictitious demand for low standards, which he will then satisfy. <laughs> that sounds very reasonable. Yes, yes. And, uh, yes. Uh, I think the talks team for Lord of Garden should probably bear that in mind when they're coming down. <laughs> but that was a wonderfully interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter's are, are the last speaker for this, this winter season. Uh, Mike Martin, who is uh, very uh, considerably, or considering uh, that he's just come back from a holiday abroad, he's uh, isolating at home, I don't know he's listening, but I certainly want to pay tribute to Mike, who puts all of these talks together, puts the program together, a huge amount of work that he's done over, the, uh, over these last, last few years. And I'm led to believe he's already got a really good program lined up for, for next, uh, uh, next year as well. It is the last talk of the, uh, uh, this this winter series for us, but I'm led to believe that in one week's time, there's a talk which is uh, organised by the Bodhagon Social Group. And uh, some of you may remember that about two years ago, Professor Colin Campbell of the Huntley Institute gave a talk here, a superb talk. He's coming back uh, a week this evening, yeah, a week this evening. It's not going to be on YouTube, and he's talking about vertical farming which will be fa fascinating and uh, uh, again the proceeds will go to the uh, uh, to the community hall so peter can't thank you enough for, for coming coming back again <laughs> okay. i should also just pay tribute to the the people who work here Alan, who's disappearing up the stairs, who, who make, make all of this possible. And uh, to Graham, Graham Atkinson here, who uh, understands technology and has put uh, broadcast all of these talks over the years. Thank you so much. And the rest of the talks, please, some of whom are here this evening. Thank you also. Thank you.